Okay, good evening everyone. Uh, by my watch it is 7 o'clock Eastern and so we are going to be starting with the presentation momentarily. Uh, we'll just uh, wait a minute here and see if we have any uh, latecomers jump on and then we'll get started. Okay, so uh, let's get started with tonight's presentation. So uh, I've had this up on the screen for about 10 minutes now. And so hopefully some of you have had an opportunity to, uh, to take a look at this if you haven't tuned into one of these presentations before. Uh, so there is, uh, I do have a lot of social media presence. And you can take make note of uh, some of those uh, sites, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, some hashtags there for you. Uh, also, uh, a few housekeeping items before we get started. So uh, the live comments for this presentation are disabled. And so I will not be taking questions as the presentation is going on. If you do have questions during the course of the presentation, uh, you can make note of the email address there and you can send your email questions to me. And if I receive them before the end of the presentation, I can um, try to answer them the best that I can. I do have my phone right beside me here, so um, I'll see if I get any uh, before our time is up. So, um, again, welcome everybody, um, especially to those of you who are maybe tuning in for the first time. Um, this is the third uh, installment of these online presentations that I am doing. And so the topic of tonight's presentation is Lee Blaine and the... Uh, um, I guess subtopic that we're going to talk about. So what we're going to be taking a look at is, uh, and if you're not familiar with it, is the ghost town of Gunflint. And so some of you might be familiar with different topics uh, related to Lee Blaine. Some of you um, might be familiar with the Port Arthur Duluth and Western Railway and some of the places on it, which obviously it was. Some of you might be familiar with the Boundary Waters area and, uh, you know, may have heard of it or you maybe have been to the Gunflint Lake area and, um, you know, maybe just want to learn something about it. So, uh, again, that's the, going to be the topic of our uh, discussion tonight. And so what I'm going to be doing is going to be talking to you a little bit about the story of how this ghost town came to be. We're going to be taking a look at some information. We're going to be taking a look at some maps. We're going to be taking a look at some photos. So quite a number of things that we're going to be um, doing over the course of the next sort of hour or so. Um, I will try to um, keep within that hour. Uh, I know in some of the past presentations I've gone a little bit longer than I sort of wanted to, but um, this is a little bit shorter presentation. And so hopefully we'll be done uh, in that um, hour time frame or so. Okay, so before we actually get into the presentation, I just want to take an opportunity to introduce myself. Uh, again, especially if this is the first presentation that you are um, tuning into. And so my name is Dave Basil, and I am a history teacher uh, in Thunder Bay, Ontario. And so for the past 22 years, I've been teaching history at St. Patrick High School. And um, so um, you can see uh, on the screen here a little bit of uh, some photographs of, of, uh, of my job and some of the things that I do in my spare time. So uh, again, I've, uh, I've been teaching for quite a number of years. I also coach football uh, at the school. And um, I'm also married. I have a couple of great boys who sometimes join me on my adventures, whether they uh, maybe are 100% into it or not. Um, and uh, personally for myself, I've been doing research on some of these topics for a very, very long period of time. Um, my uh, introduction to um, some of the history of the area around Lee Blaine first came in the year 1990. And that was the first year that I uh, visited North Lake, um, which is obviously adjacent to Gunflint Lake. And I sort of became kind of uh, interested and sort of enamored with the, uh, the railway line that was kind of running through the area. And then four years later, in 1994, when I was in university, I actually started doing some formal research on the railway. At the time, there was 
um, no literature uh, about the railway that was out there, any formal literature. And so um, uh, I started doing some research, I started doing some field work. Um, that year in 1994 was actually my first trip to Lee Blaine. Uh, I actually spent some time uh, tracing the, uh, the railway line and um, uh, I actually traveled to Gunflint and uh, was able to visit that. I did make a return visit in 1997, which you can see a picture here on the screen. Um, all of the, uh, the pictures here um, that you see uh, were all taken sort of in the same kind of relative area. The, uh, the Boundary Waters area is one of my favorite areas uh, to visit. And I, again, I do spend quite a bit of time down there, unfortunately, um, um, with, the, uh, with the current pandemic situation. Uh, I haven't been able to travel at least to the Minnesota side. Uh, I will actually be down in the uh, in that area this weekend. So Saturday, I'm planning down to be down at North Lake, and so um, I'm going to be doing a little bit of field work. Uh, you know, I haven't kind of poked in around the area of the North Lake Station in quite a number of years, and uh, I want to get down there and, and take a look at a few things. And um, North Lake will will certainly come up uh, in the presentation. So this research has taken me to a lot of different places. And, um, and certainly I, I hope to continue that. My goal is to someday um, write a book uh, about all of uh, um, this research that I'm doing. Uh, I have written an article in the past about Lee Blaine, and I will be providing you with a link so you can actually read that article later on. I'm currently involved in another project, which uh, is kind of being delayed by the current um, COVID-19 situation, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Now, before we get started, I just, um, as it's been sort of uh, common in these presentations, I do want to give a little bit of a shout out. If you are interested in learning a little bit more about sort of some of the, uh, the history of, uh, of this area. So on Wednesday nights, uh, the Thunder Bay Museum and the Lincoln University Department of History uh, are offering free webinars. Uh, on a variety of different topics of, of local history. And so if you are interested in, in, um, in, in learning a little bit more about sort of the, the museum and some of their collections and some of the things that uh, people there are doing some research on, please tune in uh, on uh, Wednesday night. So that's tomorrow night, and they've been doing this for quite a, uh, a number of weeks now. And so you can find that information on their social media pages. All right, so let's get started with the presentation. So. Um, the first thing, uh, again, if you are new to tuning into this, this is going to be um, uh, obviously something that you may not have heard about. Uh, again, if you've heard my presentations before, I do include this in all my presentations. One of the things that we generally tend to do, uh, a lot of people tend to do, is they, they tend to take history and try to compartmentalize it. Uh, and they try to sort of pigeonhole it into s specific things, right? That this is, um, you know, uh, 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 this history belongs with this place, and this history belongs with a different place. Um, and, and sometimes we tend to do that. Um, and, and this story, uh, the story of Lee Blaine, can fall into that category. So some people might be thinking, well, I mean, what does the story of Lee Blaine have to do um, with, you know, I live in, in Minnesota or I live somewhere in the United States. What does the story have to do uh, with where I live? Well, um, the reality is, is that even though we have people who live in different places, uh, maybe their development for our history was a little bit different, our, 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 our background stories are slightly different in terms of how they evolved, there's a lot of shared history in there. And so I always like to include this slide and talk a little bit about the fact that even though we're talking about, um, you know, two separate geographic places, the state of Minnesota and the province of Ontario, there's a lot of shared history there. Um, and so particularly a lot of the topics that I talk about in this one, very much so, uh, Lee Blaine was something um, that was very much intertwined with uh, the history uh, that reaches across the border into Minnesota. And so again, it, it's very important that we try not to sort of separate the history. Uh, there's, there's a lot of commonality that's involved there. Um, and, and again, um, next presentation, so the presentation I'm going to be doing in a couple of weeks, which I'll talk about at the end, uh, again, ties in with all of this story. All right, so uh, some quick facts uh, about Lee Blaine, if you've never heard about it before. So Lee Blaine, again, is a ghost town, so it's, it no longer exists. Uh, it is located uh, approximately 110 kilometers from the modern city of Thunder Bay, Ontario. Uh, historically, uh, it was located 
83 miles from the city of Port Arthur. Uh, the city of Port Arthur is now part of the city of Thunder Bay. And so that is actual railway mileage. So Lee Blaine was located at milepost 83 uh, of the railway, which I will be talking about shortly. Um, couple of dates here for you again. Um, being a history teacher, I always tell my students that dates aren't super important. Um, but contextually, they are, right? I mean, sometimes we need sort of a frame of reference. And so... Um, Lee Blaine was kind of technically around uh, from 1892 to 1909, uh, officially uh, on the record books, uh, 1893 to 1902. And I'll talk a little bit about how that kind of all plays out. Um, Lee Blaine does appear in the 1901 uh, Canadian census. Uh, what's bizarre about that, though, is that when you actually take a look at the census and you'll see this huge long list of names, well, the reality is, is that not all those names belong to Lee Blaine. They actually, uh, at the time, uh, the railway line, the Canadian Northern Railway was building a rail line from Port Arthur uh, to Winnipeg. And a lot of the people that appear on that census were actually workers who were working on a railway line that was uh, many, many miles away from, from Lee Blaine. Um, some of the confusion about this uh, ghost town also stems from the fact that there is multiple spellings of the name of Lee Blaine. Um, and you'll actually see where some of these misspellings uh, originate from. And so we'll, uh, we'll sort of probe that as we go through. And so just to give you a, a little bit of a geographic context, again, uh, I mentioned I do teach history. My, my other teachable subject is geography, so I'm very big into maps. And so uh, just basically a map here, uh, essentially showing its proximity uh, to the, the nearest large um, uh, Ontario city. So here's the city of um, Thunder Bay over here. And obviously Lee Blaine, where this star is located down here on Gunflint Lake. And so if we look at a little bit of a more detailed map, um, some of you might be familiar with the geography of the area. So basically this is Gunflint Lake. You can see the international border here separating the lake in half between Canada and the United States. And uh, Lee Blaine is located on this bay on the western end uh, of the lake, probably about a, about a couple of miles from um, the western tip uh, of the lake. All right, so where does the story of Lee Blaine start with? Um, and so the start, story of Lee Blaine starts with a railway. So some of you might have been listening in or may, might have taken in at a later date the presentation that I did last week on the Port Arthur, Duluth, and Western Railway. So there are going to be parts of this presentation where you're going to see some similar information. You're going to see some similar um, graphics and, and maps and things like that. Obviously, um, you mean there's only so much information you can draw from. So... The history of Lee Blaine is tied very, very closely with that of the Port Arthur, Duluth, and Western Railway. Now, um, last week's presentation, if you haven't seen it, it is up on the YouTube channel. You can watch it. Um, there is a whole history to that railway line itself. But officially, uh, it began as a railway line known as the Thunder Bay Colonization Railway in 1883. The purpose of that rail line was to basically tap some silver mines that were located southwest uh, of the city of Thunder Bay, uh, the modern city of Thunder Bay, and also to provide a link uh, to the city of Duluth and, and access um, some of the rail lines that serve that city. Now, unfortunately, because of a number of reasons, political um, and financial, the railway was never constructed. And so in 1887, uh, they decided to change the name. And so the name changed to the Port Arthur, Duluth and Western. And at the same time, the route officially changed as well. And uh, last week's presentation, I talked about the fact that there, there actually was uh, discussion uh, about a, a rail line to Gunflint Lake as far back as 10 years uh, before this official change, right? So going back to 1877, there was discussion um, of this potential rail line uh, into the area. But now it was official. Now it was officially that the railway was going to terminate, at least on the Canadian side, at Gunflint Lake, and then, uh, as we're going to see, travel into the United States to tap iron deposits and then hopefully make that connection to the city of Duluth. Um, now, um, obviously, the, there was a motivation behind all of this. Um, again, the um, at the time, um, places like Duluth was booming because of the iron ore business. 
And so the Canadian Lakehead, so the cities of Fort William and Port Arthur, uh, wanted to basically access uh, that wealth. They wanted to become as prosperous as the city of Duluth. And um, obviously, um, you know, the, the investors of the railway wanted to reap that financial uh, benefit. Now, unfortunately, because again, of financial reasons, uh, construction never really happened. Uh, and so this is a map uh, from 1887. And so again, this has coincided with the change of the name. And again, it's, a, it's an old map and, and uh, it's very difficult to see some of the things on there, but you can make out the name of the Port Arthur Duluth and Western Railway excuse me, this was the um, original route. It did change once it was constructed. And so basically you can see it uh, working its way um, westward from the city of Port Arthur uh, down along the Whitefish Valley um, to Whitefish Lake um, and then continuing uh, in a southwesterly direction um, to Sandstone Lake, Sand Lake, as you can see here on the map. And then eventually, it's not on the map here, but eventually waking, making its way down to Gunflint Lake. Now, uh, again, one of the big reasons for the construction of uh, this railway, and we will talk a little bit more about that shortly, um, is to tap the, uh, the iron range that was just sort of being developed at the time, and that was the Gunflint Range. And so basically this shows you a map uh, of all the iron ranges of the western part of the Lake Superior area. And so you can see the Gunflint Range here, which basically extends so I'm just across the border uh, into Minnesota in a northeasterly direction uh, through Ontario all the way up past uh, the modern city of Thunder Bay. You can see the Vermilion Range, which was very, very big at the time. So places like Tower and Ely, uh, the Mesabi Range, which is still being worked today. And then you can see some of the other ones in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan. And so again, um, this is what they were kind of after. So uh, eventually in 1889, so two years after the name change, construction begins. And so some of the people that were associated with this railway in, uh, in the city of Port Arthur were some of the most notable citizens uh, of that city. And that included Thomas Marks, who was the first mayor uh, of the city of Port Arthur, D.F. Burke, uh, who was another prominent citizen. Uh, James Conmey uh, became the contractor. So Conmey and Middleton were the, uh, the two guys that were entrusted with the construction of this railway. And again, if you were listening into last week's presentation, uh, you heard a little bit about the conflict of interest revolving around Conmey, uh, simply because of the fact that uh, he was the member of parliament. So he was a political representative for this area. And now he's basically been given the contract to build this railway line. So he is benefiting financially and potentially politically from this enterprise, right? And so obviously today there would have been all kinds of red flags that go up, um, huge conflict of interests uh, with regard to that, but um, different time, uh, different rules, I guess. And so uh, nothing was, you know, maybe externally said, maybe there was some discussion internally. All right, so construction begins in September of 1889, and so by um, the end of the year, uh, rails have been as laid as far as um, the village of Stanley, which is located at milepost 19. Um, however, uh, as things roll into 1890, from 1889, um, reports start to surface that there's some 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 troubles afoot, right? There there's some there's some issues going on here, and maybe the uh, the, the the railway isn't. Um, doing as well um, from a financial standpoint as maybe everybody thinks they are. And so, uh, again, you can see on the slide here that uh, financial issues were afoot. The pace of construction begins to slow. Um, basically, the, the grading is continuing, but they're not laying any rails. And the reason why they're not laying any rails is because they don't have any to lay. Um, based, uh, essentially, there's no money uh, to purchase rails. And it's around this time, so right at the early part of 1890, that something very significant happens. It doesn't really emerge um, in, you know, in, in terms of the news until a few months later, but this is where the fortunes of the railway really begin to turn. And the reason why we're talking about this is because it ties in directly with Lee Blaine. So in March of 1890, all of a sudden, some of the names that we've been seeing in the newspaper reports 
um, you know, people like Marx and, 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 and Burke and Conmey and some of these individuals associated with the railway, some new names start appearing alongside those names. And the first two that we see um, are the names of Hugh Blaine and Joseph Eby. And so Hugh, uh, Blaine and Eby uh, were businessmen in Toronto, and they were the owners of a wholesale grocery firm by the known name of Eby Blaine and Company. Um, they were very uh, affluent businessmen, very, very well connected. Uh, Blaine particularly was very heavily involved in the Toronto Board of Trade, uh, obviously very heavily involved in some of the social circles uh, within the city of Toronto itself, right? So we're not just talking about small players here. We're talking about some, some very well connected, some very, very, um, you know, people with some very deep pockets. And so this began a six-year involvement uh, for E.B. and Blaine with the railway. Now, uh, obviously, they um, had their own um, businesses to deal with, and so their representative on the board of directors of the railway uh, eventually became uh, David Blaine, who was uh, Hugh's brother. He was an ex-member of Parliament, and he himself was, a uh, uh, again, a very affluent businessman in the city of Toronto, and so, um, you know, certainly they would play a very big role in the construction of the railway. So just some images here for you. And so essentially looking left to right. So we have Blaine, uh, we have Edie, and then we have David Blaine, again, who is the man representing the firm on the board of directors of the railway. And so just an image here of uh, Edie Blaine and company, their, uh, their big um, building in the city of Toronto. Um, and you can see the title here, The Queen City to the Rescue, which was the name given to the city of Toronto at the time. It's known as the Queen City. Um, and so, again, judging by the size of the establishment, again, we're talking about um, some some very affluent businessmen, kind of their, uh, um, their, actually their brochure. I was actually just taking a look at it before the presentation. And um, this brochure that you see, this is the cover of it, was 110 pages long. Um, so just ridiculous amount of goods um, that they were importing. Uh, a lot of specialty uh, items, coffees, teas, um, products from uh, places like uh, Asia. Um, so, you I mean, dealing with a lot of very high-end types of things. So around the same time, uh, a couple of other names begin to appear uh, in the newspapers, and those names are Arthur Lee and John Lees. And these two individuals uh, were the owners of a hardware retailer, again, in the city of Toronto, known as Rice, Lewis & Son. And so their appearance um, in relationship to the railway would begin a nine-year involvement with the railway. And these two individuals, more than anything else, uh, would play a very, very big role in kind of the direction of the, um, of the railway. Again, very, very affluent, very well connected. Lee as well um, was very heavily involved in the Board of Trade in the, uh, in the city of Toronto, uh, involved with banks and other enterprises. Um, and so again, they had their own business interests to take care of. And so their interests on the, in, the, uh, in the railway enterprise uh, on the board of directors would be looked after by Lee's son, um, who um, was himself a businessman, but also was a uh, part-time soldier in um, one of the most famous uh, units in the city of Toronto, the Queen's Own Rifles. Uh, at the time, the Canadian militia was kind of a very prestige thing to belong to. And so just some images for you. Uh, and so starting on the left here, we have Lee, uh, and then Lee's, and then uh, Lee's son, uh, again, who was the representative on the uh, board of directors. And so this is an image of um, Rice, Lewis & Son, again, a hardware retailer. Um, and so this was one of their, their stores. Um, I did come across an image that showed uh, their store at a later time. So they actually did even expand their operation. What's interesting is when you take a look at their ad here, and so you can see, uh, again, the ad, Arthur Lee, President, uh, John Lee's Vice President, um, bar iron, steel, chain, rope, um, saws, all these types of things. And you, you sort of start to wonder going, well, it's kind of interesting, um, you know, and it mentions down here lumber, uh, lumbermen's contractors, mills, engineers, right? You're probably thinking, you know, I wonder where a lot of the goods, um, you know, that were, you know, being used by the railway were coming from, right? So not only were these uh, individuals looking to benefit 
from the actual, you know, from the the actual completion of the railway, that they were actually going to benefit from the, um, you know, from the actual construction of it as well. So the big question becomes, and this is kind of part of the mystery around this, and we don't have a real conclusive answer to this, is why would these individuals from the city of Toronto, um, and, and you know, even today, Toronto is very far removed uh, from the city of Thunder Bay. We're 15 hours away by car. Why would they care about something that's happening kind of in backwoods Ontario, New Ontario, they used to call it, right? Because it was, you know, sort of this, you know, far flung part of the province. Um, and some of the answers are, are, are pretty simple. Well, first of all, at the time, uh, Canada was a new country. It's a growing country. Ra railways and mines are were the investment at the time, right? I mean, um, some of you uh, probably are very familiar with it with the stock market. Some of you are probably very involved with that and investments and things like that. At this time, those were the things that people were pumping their money into. Railways were being built across the continent like crazy. Mines were being opened up. These were the places that people were making their money. Obviously, there was a very high risk, high reward. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the. Uh, um, um, you know, some of the shaky foundations that some of these things were, were, were built on. Uh, but I mean, this is what people were involved with. Um, Lee and Lees had a past history of it being involved with railway ventures. Uh, they were actually involved with a, a railway um, down in their area, the Toronto Gray and Bruce. Uh, and they actually had a locomotive on that railway that was named after them. It was named after, not them particularly, but named after their company, the Rice, Lewis & Son. Um, there is some suggestion that there was a connection between um, these Toronto individuals and people that were looking to build something called the Ontario and Rainy River Railway, uh, which was going to be basically a line from Port Arthur uh, through to Fort Francis and Rainy River into that area. Um, and there obviously, um, we don't talk about it in this, this um, presentation, but basically eventually those two railways combine their resources and combine some of their government subsidies when they build the line. Um, could there have been a uh, an attraction to the Gunflint Range? And I'm going to show you something uh, here in a second. Um, and then a family connection. So John Lees, uh, who is, uh, again, the partner of, of, of Arthur Lee, um, he actually had a cousin whose name was John Lees. Now, I don't know if anybody who's listening in does any type of you know uh, genealogy work, that type of thing. One of the most frustrating things about researching um, in, in this era is the duplicity of names. Uh, it can get so frustrating because you're trying to track somebody down. And there's all these repetitive names. Now, the irony of that is I'm sort of, you know, kind of ranting about it. Um, you know, uh, I, I have that same sort of coincidence in my family, um, you know, this this commonality of names, which is a very common type of thing. Uh, my father's name was Angelo, and he had um, four cousins that were all named Angelo, right? So very common thing at the time. So um, let's talk a little bit about that connection um, to the Gunflint Range. So, um, you know, sometimes you just sort of find sort of things by accident. So when I was doing research and, and, and looking up all of these individuals uh, from Toronto that were, were getting involved with the railway, and I call them Toronto Syndicate. That's what the name that I give to them. Kind of a play on uh, the group that have, that built the Canadian Pacific Railway um, back in the 1880s. They were originally known as the Syndicate before they formalized and became um, a company known as the Canadian Pacific. So I'm kind of playing on that a little bit. So what ends up happening is as I'm researching this, um, I come across this document and it's talking about this meeting that happens in Toronto. Uh, and it's uh, the meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And they have their annual meeting, their 38th meeting in Toronto uh, on August, uh, in August of 1889. And uh, the reason why I was looking at this document was because some of the people at the meeting uh, were people like Blaine and Lee. And, and so I was just kind of seeing if there was something in there. And just by coincidence, and this was, you know, down the road, this was uh, a while later, uh, I happened to just glance at this document again, and I'm looking at the list of speakers. And so it's broken down in all these different sections, and all of a sudden I come across this. And so right here, um, we have a... Um, presentation 
um, that and the topic of it is on a possible chemical origin of the iron ores of the Kuwaitan in Minnesota. And the presentation is being given by the Winchell brothers. Now, those names might not be for very familiar to you, um, but I've mentioned them in previous presentations, um, especially last week. The, the Winchell brothers uh, were actually um, the guys who later on went on to write the geology of Minnesota. And um, this is not something I would take to court. Uh, this is not something that you would uh, win your case on. But I started thinking going, could this be the connection? Right? This is definitely not a smoking gun, but could these Toronto individuals happen to have gone to this presentation and listened to the Winchells talk about the iron ore in Minnesota and maybe they would have heard about the Gunflint Range and maybe that would have set something thinking, right? You're thinking August 1889, they became involved in the railway in eight, early 1890. Obviously, we don't have any documents, we don't have any letters, we don't know kind of what was going on behind the scenes, but could this have been the trigger for all of this? Uh, and again, very circumstantial, but really beyond this, we have nothing. We have nothing to really tie these individuals uh, into this project. So for me, this is maybe the, the, the trigger event that got it all started. And so uh, the end result of all of this uh, is that in January of 1890, all of a sudden uh, bonds uh, are floated. Uh, that generate money uh, for the railway. Remember, they're having financial problems. And then a loan comes in from the Canadian Bank of Commerce for $1.5 million, you know, ironically at the time. And what's interesting is the um, some of these individuals have ties to the Canadian Bank of Commerce, shockingly, right? Uh, and so the... Um, um, this money is used to resume construction and um, a big pile of rails comes in eventually in the later part of 1890. Uh, we know these rails are all from 1890 uh, because the majority of the rails that I've found um, that are still kicking around on different parts of the railway, they're from different manufacturers, but they're all 1890 rails, right? So uh, we have that sort of tie into all of this. Okay. So, uh, basically, once this uh, money starts pouring in, then construction resumes, and by the summer of 1892, um, they're working away on the railway. It's very difficult um, construction, basically, um, by the end of 1891, they're at North Lake, and so it takes them all of 1892 to build 20 miles of railway. They basically got to build from North Lake uh, along the Ontario side of North Lake and Gunflint Lake, and then they're going to build six miles into Minnesota. That takes a whole year, and it basically talks about the challenges that they had. Um, again, if you're familiar with the area, um, you'll know the big rock cuts along the shore of the lake, many trestles, uh, a lot of work uh, that was going into that. Uh, there was a lot of positive news. Um, um, at the time as well, too, because good things were happening uh, across the border, which we're going to talk about in a second. Okay, so um, just an image here for you. So this is a photograph that was taken in September of 1891, and this was taken on an excursion. And so basically people are being taken to the end of the track and end of construction. So they're taken uh, to about Sand Lake, Sandstone Lake. And uh, that picture was taken. We don't know exactly where the picture was taken, um, but we know it was taken at that time. Um, and so here's a few images for you of uh, actual construction. And so this picture was taken some point in 1892. This picture is taken on North Lake. And again, if you're familiar with the geography of the area, at the east end of the lake, there is a small island. Uh, and so the picture is taken from the island looking back towards the shore and you can see the construction camp here. You can see a series of uh, tent-like structures uh, all along the bay. And in particular, you can see this one right here. And the reason why I'm kind of pointing this one out to you uh, is because when we go to the next slide, uh, we actually see that building here. And so this photograph is taken from um, beside that particular structure and we're basically looking down the length of the lake uh, we can see this little boat in the background. This is the Xena. I talked about this in, in last week's uh, couple, presentation a couple weeks ago. Um, this was basically a steam tug that was used to facilitate construction. 
uh, in the area. And so basically kind of plied back and forth. Uh, we don't know where this picture was taken, obviously somewhere along the line and basically again, um, some sort of construction camp. Uh, essentially you can see uh, tents here and you can see a coach that's kind of been spotted along here and you can see one of the locomotives. Um, again, we don't really know where this was taken, but we know that it was taken at the same time because this, it was the same photographer. All right, so what's the good news coming from across the border? So let's talk a little bit about this Minnesota connection to all of this. Uh, and I did talk a little bit about this in my previous presentation a couple of weeks ago, and I'll talk more about this later on, but I'm going to be doing a presentation specifically uh, about this uh, in a couple of weeks. So that'll be my um, fourth and final presentation. So in July of 1885, um, the State Bank of Minneapolis is incorporated, and shortly thereafter, um, a company known as the American Realty Company is incorporated. Both of these companies uh, are led by two Minneapolis businessmen by the name of John Paulson and Christian Courtgard. And so, um, again, these guys came up in last week's, uh, the other presentation, and again, we're gonna be talking a little bit more about them uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, and so again, um, Paulson, Civil War veteran, um, very well connected, um, you know, uh, was involved with other iron ventures in places like um, Wisconsin uh, before. So uh, had some sort of, um, you know, uh, connection to this and had some background in this. And so basically, um, the part where we don't know, again, here's part of the mystery is we don't know how he got tied into this, you know, yet uh unproven um you know uh potential exploration in the northern part of minnesota we don't know how that all happened so whatever the case is um the american realty company uh starts buying up lands uh in parts of cook county on uh, the western uh part of cook county uh, west of gunflint lake and township 65 north range 4 west um, and this is where it kind of gets a little bit shady. Uh, we don't quite, again, know all the things that were going on, but the best that I can figure, what was happening was these guys didn't have all of the money uh, to fulfill, um, you know, sort of their ambitions. And so I, they were siphoning, basically siphoning money from the bank. They were embezzling money from the bank and using it through this real estate company to buy up lands. And, and um, there is some suggestion that it was basically a scam. I, based on past practice and what people like Paulson was involved in, in the past, I don't think it was a scam. I think these guys were legitimate. I think they were going to take this money. They were going to use it to exploit this uh, situation and then quietly kind of put the money back. Um, and again, you know, there was a lot of shady things going on. The land was being bought in Paulson's name and Coast Guard's name and the names of their wives um, and specifically in areas uh, within that, that um, area of section 28 and 29. Um, and so eventually they are joined by uh, another businessman, uh, a guy by the name of Oren Kinney uh, and he's based out of Ely, uh, Minnesota. And in March of 1892, they incorporate the Gunflint Lake Iron Company. And so this is going to be the entity that the railway is going to deal with. Uh, they start digging test pits uh, in parts of Section 28. Uh, and then they eventually dig three shafts uh, in Section 28 and 29 that range from 75 to 105 feet deep. And then in July of 1892, here is the big kind of payoff. They sign a contract with the railway that they are going to ship over a period of 10 years, 1 million tons of ore, right? So this is the big payoff that the railway is, is basically banking on. This is why they've built into this area. They are going to exploit this mine and they are going to make huge profits from the, the iron that they're going to pull out of this mine. And you know, the city of Port Arthur, the city of Fort William become, you know, booming metropolises. Um, they were become just as wealthy as the city of Duluth is. So um, construction, meanwhile, on the railway is continuing uh, and it continues to the summer and fall of 1892. Now, uh, this was something, again, that I mentioned in my previous presentation in October uh, of 1892. We did have a, a tragedy that took place. And the reason why we're talking about this is it took place very, very close to Lee Blaine. Uh, and so there was a blasting accident and one of the workers by the name of Joseph Montagia was killed 
uh, on October the 8th in this blasting accident. And, um, you know, after he, he, after he died, his fellow workers carved a cross in the side of the rock cut where, near where he died, basically as a memorial to him. And that cross is still there in the rock cut. And so um, here's the, uh, the newspaper article, article talking a little bit about it. And so it's from the following week. And so here is the rock cut where it's located in. And I've had the opportunity to visit this cross on, on several occasions. It's not easy to find. Um, you have to kind of know where to sort of look for it. Uh, but here it is. Uh, like I said, it's remarkably well preserved uh, after being carved back in, in 1892. So, um, people like Montagia would have been working out of a construction camp that was located um, on a site at the west end of Gunflint Lake. They picked basically this, you know, one of the prettiest spots on the lake, a uh, very beautiful sandy bay, uh, and this is where the construction camp was located. Uh, by November, the ballast crews, so basically ballast is all that sort of uh, stone-like gravel that's spread around the uh, the tracks. It basically acts as a stabilizer to keep the, the rails and the ties from shifting. Um, they basically make their way to Iron Rage Lake, and we believe that um, it was some of these uh, workers that built, um, in addition to their, their accommodations, their cabins, their tents, whatever they were staying in, they built rock ovens uh, to bake their bread. And, and we think it can be attributed to some of the Italian workers um, that uh, they were working on the railway. Uh, construction also began on a station uh, at this particular site. And so this is a newspaper article. Uh, you can see the date here from the 5th of November, 1892. And it basically says work on the PADNW is being rushed. Um, uh, new men are being brought in by the 100. A new station is being built at Gunflint Lake, which I just talked about. This place is uh, now a scene of great activity. The gravel crew has moved up from Iron Range and the sons of sunny Italy. Uh, so there's our Italian workers have erected their picturesque habitations on a new side of the lake. Any architect who wishes to solve the problem of cheap homes for the working classes would do, uh, would do well to pay them a visit. Uh, and so again, just basically gives you a sense of kind of what's, is, what's going on at that particular site. Now, um, unfortunately, we don't have any pictures of what um, those rock ovens would have looked like uh, at that particular site. This is um, uh, a picture of one uh, that exists that's actually still preserved out in British Columbia. And so this is possibly what they might have appeared to look like at the time. Uh, so again, basically kind of this igloo-shaped um, structure that was made out of rock. And the idea was you build a fire inside, and once the fire's nice and hot, you basically pull out all the uh, the rocks are nice and hot. You pull out all the, the, the coals and stuff and put your bread inside, and now you've got an oven to bake your bread. Uh, so eventually construction makes its way uh, across into Minnesota. Uh, this is the bridge that once spanned the narrows at uh, the west end of Gunflint Lake. So basically this picture is taken from the Gunflint Lake side, looking northwards um, at the narrows. So essentially you have Ontario here on the right, Minnesota on the left, and Magnetic Lake in the background. And so um, today, if you, from, again, if you're familiar with the area, you know that there is basically some gravel, uh, some rock cribs in the area. There's the piles um, from the, uh, the bridge that are still in the water. So um, the by the end of December 1892, the railway is completed. So um, immediately after the new year, on uh, January the 4th, 1893, a special train leaves the city of Port Arthur that's bound for Gunflint. It's full of dignitaries, um, basically um, a who's who, uh, people that are associated with the railway, um, the leading citizens of, you know, the city of Port Arthur, um, you know, people, maybe people who invested in the railway. Uh, they are going to take a tour of the newly completed line. And obviously to make it all official, they even have a U.S. Customs Inspector on board because they are going to be crossing the border uh, into the United States. And so essentially they see the line, they cross into the United States, they go right up to the Paulson line. They're met there by John Paulson. Uh, he's there, he gives them a personal tour of everything that's sort of happening at the site. Everybody's excited. Uh, everybody's looking forward to all the great things that are going to be happening in the coming year. Um, so that same day, the, um, the special excursion train stops at this construction uh, site uh, on Gunflint Lake. Um, the railway has decided 
that this is going to be the terminus, the Canadian terminus for the railway. Um, they've already built a station at the site. It's, it's 40 feet by 24 feet. Um, and basically, if again, if you know the geography of the area, um, really this is the only kind of spot of flat land um, on the Ontario side of Gunflint Lake. So this is where they are going to put this terminus. There's going to be a station. They're looking at putting in a roundhouse. They're going to put in, obviously, some sort of repair facilities. And there's a town that's going to build up around this uh, because this is where, you know, uh, trains are going to be coming in from the mine, eventually trains coming in from the United States. This is the big changeover point. So we need a name for this town. And so there's a lot of discussion. There's a lot of names kind of batted around about what this is going to be, what, uh, you know, what, what should they call it? And so the discussion um, sort of turns to, well, maybe we should name it after these Toronto guys. These are the ones that have provided all of this money to build this railway. It should bear their name. So now they start sort of tossing out combinations and eventually they settle uh, on the name Lee Blaine, which is an amalgamation of Arthur Lee and Hugh Blaine, right, sticking those together. And so uh, this is the connection. And so this, you know, town that's going to be um, set up on Gunflit Lake has a direct sort of conduit to the city of Toronto. Uh, and as I've written here, basically they're hoping that it's going to turn into a great metropolis because of this. And so here's some newspaper articles from the period. Uh, this is the St. Paul Globe. Uh, and it's basically talking about the opening of the railway, and at the bottom there, the new town at the boundary was named Lee Blaine. Uh, this is from the Manitoba Free Press, and it's talking about the completion of the line, and it's talking about the iron, and how great it's going to be, uh, and how they're going to build to the city of Ely. And again, at the bottom here is the, you know, the town named Lee Blaine. Um, this is the Fort William Journal, and it's talking about, uh, again, the same sort of situation. They're visiting the Paulson Mine, um, and then it talks a little bit about the, you know, the town receiving the name of Fleet Blaine, um, and it says, success to the metropolis of the Gunflint Iron Region. May its growth be rapid. Uh, and so, uh, again, talking a little bit about, um, you know, the, the anticipated success um, uh, that they, they hoped that this place would, would get. And so this is actually um, one of the earliest maps that we have uh, of the completed railway line. So this is map was published in 1893. And so essentially we can see the railway line uh, here leaving the city of Port Arthur, uh, again, making its way westward uh, along the Kamenistiqua River and then along the Whitefish Valley uh, to Whitefish Lake. And then in, again, in that, still in that southwesterly direction, working its way down to North Lake. And then you can basically see Lee Blaine right here, right? So the big terminus point uh, here on the Canadian side and then the line making its way down to the Gunflint Iron Mines. Um, again, this, this was a, a map that I used in my um, uh, previous presentation. And so this is basically just showing the planned connection for the railway. So again, the railway terminating just across the border in Minnesota and the proposed connection between Gunflint and the Duluth and Iron Range Railway um, Railroad at Ely. Uh, and that would give them access to the city of Duluth. And so in June of 1893, the um, railway publishes its first time card. Um, Lee Blaine is not on there, uh, but basically it gives you a sense of the uh, time it would take to travel on the railway. So trains would leave the city of Port Arthur at one o'clock in the afternoon and arrive at Gunflint at uh, after eight o'clock. So seven hours, seven hours to travel uh, that distance. And uh, just make note of that because you're going to see that it gets worse. Um, so I uh, showed you a map of the Canadian side. So this is basically a map of the Minnesota side of the rail line. So again, you can see the railway crossing the border uh, at the Gunflint Narrows and then working its way along the Cross Valley, Cross River Valley, uh, and then uh, going into a switchback and then working its way over to the Paulson Mine. Now, one of the interesting things is we don't really know much about Lee Blaine. Um, it's been very difficult tracking down information uh, because it wasn't around for a very long period of time. Um, we just don't have any data. We only know of one person um, who actually lived at Lee Blaine. And it comes from this one newspaper article. So this was published in May of 1893. 
And so basically, uh, it's from one of the local newspapers in, uh, in um, Port Arthur. And it says, Adolf Pereiras uh, is opening a place of business at Lee Lane near the American boundary on the railway. Um, and again, this guy was a previous hotel owner, uh, essentially looking to capitalize uh, on the business that's going to be generated from this railway and from the iron mine that's going to be opening up. Now, what's interesting about this guy is I never sort of made this, this connection. So I had this article. And then I also had another article, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about this article later on. But this was an article that appeared in the Minnesota History News in, in 1962. And it was based on information that was provided by Justine Kerfa, um, who, uh, you know, some of you know that she was basically a legend in the, uh, in the Gunflint area. So in the article, she writes, uh, in 1947, an elderly gentleman in his 70s by the name of Perot of Port Arthur stopped at Gunflint Lodge and took a boat trip to the site of Lee Lane where he had stayed in the hotel as a small boy. And I sort of never really kind of made the connection. And then I don't know why one day all of a sudden I was looking at, you know, this article with Adult Pereiras and then something clicked. And then I look at this article where Justine is talking about this Perot. And then I start going, Pereiras, Perot. And then I'm thinking, you know, this article was written in 1962, and she's talking about something that happened in 1947, right? I mean, everybody's memory plays tricks on them, right? Maybe she didn't get the guy's name. Maybe that's what, you know, what she interpreted the name to be. Then I started thinking, oh my God, right? Could this Perot that she's talking about, could this be Adolf Pereira's son? And so, of course, you do a little bit of genealogical research, and so you come up with this, this is right from the um, Ancestry.ca or Ancestry.com is your friend, uh, got a lot of information from Ancestry. Um, uh, anyway, so basically this is the 1891 census. And so what we see on here is we have Adolf Pereiras and his family. And if you go down the list, you'll notice that there are three sons that are a young age in 1891. There's a Clarence who's 10, there's an Ernest who's 7, and there's a Clement who's 4. And if you start doing your math, you start saying, well, it could have been, I think this Clement was a little bit too young, but even this Ernest Pereiras, right? He's 7 years old, so he would have been 9 in 1893. And so, you know, he would have been uh, born in 1884, and so um, in 1947, he would have been in his mid-60s, and that would have sort of fit the time frame, or even this Clarence prayer, so we'd even be closer uh, linked to that. Um, and so, um, you know, here's the connection, right? So we basically know that one of the residents was uh, Adolf Pereiras, and we know that for a time, one of his sons at least visited him uh, at that particular site. So it's kind of a neat little connection. So it's the only kind of person or persons that we know that actually lived there. Um, shortly after uh, the railway is completed, we have another little bonus, right? So we basically have... Uh, the railway's completed, uh, the iron mine's going to open up, we're going to build through to Ely. Now we have another bonus, uh, and that is gold. And so this is actually coming out of an Ontario geological report, and so it talks about a gold property has been discovered one mile north of Lee Blaine Station on the north of the Western Railway, um, three miles east of the boundary road line. And it basically talks about this uh, shaft. Um, that was sunk in June of 1894. The shaft is six feet by six feet to the depth of 22 feet. Um, I actually went looking for this. Um, at, in 2013, I sat down and, and had a little bit of a conversation with, uh, with Bruce Kerfoot. Um, some of you who are listening in know Bruce. Uh, and he basically talked a little bit about, he, he provided some of the information for this presentation. And so obviously growing up on the lake, he was very familiar with the, with the area. And he actually told me, he said, I, I, I've seen that shaft before. And so, um, um, he basically, as, as uh, a young man, had visited this site, uh, and the person that had brought him there was a man by the name of Charlie Cook. And, and again, Charlie Cook is another sort of legend on Gunflint Lake. Um, he was uh, an indigenous man uh, that lived on the Canadian side uh, of the lake uh, for many, many years until he passed away in 1997. Um, would have been alive at the time that 
you know, uh, not when this was happening, uh, but some of his family members would have been, and would have been very sort of familiar with the area. And, and Bruce told me that Charlie brought him to show to see this site. Uh, and so Bruce tried to give me sort of some ideas, but uh, the area has been changed so much in recent years. There was a big blowdown in uh, in in um, 1999, and there was a forest fire in 2007. So the area has been sort of very radically transformed, and um, you know some of the landmarks and some of the features that um, you know would have been there. If, you know, some of them have obviously changed. And so I tried looking, and I was not very successful. It's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Um, maybe at some point I'll try to go back and, and, and look again, but I was not able to, uh, to locate it. But apparently it was still there, this, this shaft that had been sunk into the ground. Okay, so the background to all of this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is um, um, basically as the railway is being completed, as everybody is looking forward uh, to all of this, um, sort of not so good things are happening uh, in the world. And the first sort of glimmer of this uh, happens in February of 1893 when an American uh, railroad, the Philadelphia and Reading, uh, goes bankrupt. And it's the first of many railways that go bankrupt during this time. And essentially it's a result of a lot of speculation that is happening. There's a lot of railways and mines that are being built this time that are being built uh, on speculation that are just, you know, people are kind of taking a flyer. And of course, what this is doing is um, obviously this is you know this is an implosion here uh, of all of this shaky financing, and so uh, of course all kinds of uh, bad things happen uh, in something that becomes known as the Panic of 1893 or the Depression of 1893. Iron prices basically hit rock bottom. Um, there's a, a huge depression uh, around the world. Uh, particularly people in the United States start flocking to banks to take their money out of the bank because they're worried about the banks kind of going under, them losing their money. So this leads uh, to a run on banks. Uh, and so it leads to a whole bunch of bank failures. Uh, and there's a reason why we're talking about this. Uh, obviously, this uh, financial panic spreads to Europe and depresses the markets there. And there's obviously not as much demand for North American goods. And so it's just a big, huge domino effect. So the effect that this has on the Port Arthur Duluth and Western Railway is catastrophic. So first of all, one of the reasons why the railway was built was for these silver deposits um, that were southwest of the city of Thunder Bay. Those silver mines all close. The bank runs basically caused the State Bank of Minneapolis to collapse. Now remember, and I mentioned this before, that Cart Guard has used money from the bank to finance the real estate company and the mine. And so when the bank fails, uh, again, there's a huge kind of ripple effect. And so this leads to basically in the insolvency of the American Realty Company, the insolvency of the Gunflint Iron Company, and basically closure of the mine. And when the mine closes, this is uh, a death sentence for the railway line. Um, basically, the railway has been built to this mine, and if there's no business being generated by the mine, the railway has no revenue. It goes nowhere. There's no connection. And, and the plan was, is to once they start making money from the iron business, is to build the line through to Ely. But they're not going to be able to do that because they have no money, right? And so you essentially have a rail line that runs nowhere with no money coming in. Uh, and so, again, the results are catastrophic. Now, again, the background to all of this is everybody tries to make it, you know, seem like things are okay, right? That everything's all right. And so, at the end of August, 1893, the mines are already closed. Um, the Premier of Ontario, Sir Oliver Mowat, comes to the Lakehead for a visit. And so what they decide to do is they want to show them all these great things that are happening. So they take him on a train, they take him down to uh, Whitefish Station. Um, and he his train is met at Whitefish Station by a train that's coming from Gunflint Lake. And on this train is a, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the cars on the train is a flat car, and it's got some rocks that have been taken from the Paulson mine from the iron mine and they take a very famous photograph and here's that photograph right here's this flat car of uh, iron from the mine um, and unfortunately it would be the only iron ever taken out of that mine um, 
and, and essentially there was enough iron there. Once they sort of smelted it down, there was enough iron to make uh, a small little, um, you know, miniaturized sort of horseshoe. That's all the iron that came out of there. So, uh, you know, there was a great deal of spin that was at, at work at this time. Uh, tried to make look like things were okay, but things really weren't okay. Um, and so that basically is the end of the pulse in mind, right? And so um, what we want to do now is, now that we've sort of talked about the construction of the railway, um, we've talked about the opening, we've talked about how Lee Blaine got his name, we want to start talking a little bit about what was at Lee Blaine, what we do know, uh, because again, our information is very limited. Um, so besides the station, um, which we know was there, uh, there were no less than eight buildings. And again, we're just basically basing this on um, some archaeological evidence that we have, very little, and uh, essentially information that we were getting from people who have seen the site uh, and who sort of explored the site. So uh, in 1997, I had an opportunity to sit down with Justine Kerfoot, who I mentioned before, uh, who arrived at Gunflint Lake in the late 1920s. Uh, and so some of the structures at Lee Blaine were still there, uh, were still standing. And so uh, she would have had some firsthand knowledge. Uh, again, the conversations that I had with Bruce Kerfoot, her son, and he was, you know, he explored the site and he was familiar with some of the things that would have been there. So um, most of these things were small little wood structures. There was a hotel slash trading post. Uh, we do have some evidence that was there. Uh, the site also had a 1,200-foot siding uh, and an 1,100-foot spur. And um, you, you'll be able to see some pictures of what that looks like today. Um, now, something happened. Remember, Lee Blaine is supposed to be the big point of the railway. Something happens because all of a sudden, um, Lee Blaine goes from being this big point on Gunflint Lake, and all of a sudden, everything kind of starts kind of bleeding over, and... Uh, the focal point becomes Gunflint Narrows. And I'm going to be showing you a map here. And when you take a look at the map, you only see one building on this map, which was surveyed in 1911. And so something has happened. All of these structures that were at Lee Blaine suddenly disappear, and all of a sudden a bunch of structures pop up at Gunflint Narrows. Uh, and so at the Gunflint Narrows, and again, this information comes from some documentation that we have, uh, and then some information that we've been able to get from people like Justine, who um, obviously was around when there were um, some of the uh, First Nations people that lived around the Gunflint Narrows who were alive at the time that this was all happening, would have related to her. So we know at the Gunflint Narrows there was a station, uh, there was some sort of hotel trading post. Um, we know that a guy by the name of Victor Pelche um, operated the hotel um, trading post at Gunflint Narrows from 1895 to 1901. So some sort of shift happened. Again, we don't know exactly what took place. And so here's this article talking. Uh, they spell his name wrong. That's a very common thing at the time. But this article is from 1901 talking about Pelche, uh, who's the president hotel keeper at Gunflint Post in Port Arthur. Um, and he's been there for a great number of years. So again, we do have that sort of documentation that there was something happening at the Gunflint Narrows. So, um, again, we do have some evidence to support some of the information we have about what was at Lee Blaine. Um, so this um, um, image that you see here uh, was actually from a document that was produced when the railway was sold in 1899. And so it talks about basically all of the infrastructure of the railway. And so it talks about the buildings. And so you can see at the bottom there, it says that Lee Blaine had a frame building that was 40 feet by 24 feet. It was the only frame building um, that was basically outside of the area around Thunder Bay. Stanley was 20 miles from Port Arthur, right? So every other station on the line was basically, you can see Silver Mountain, uh, a freight shed made out of logs, North Lake, freight shed made out of logs. Lee Blaine was the only sort of crafted station on the line outside of the general area around Thunder Bay. So there obviously was some importance to it. Um, this uh, next slide here talks a little bit about some of the uh, the siding. So again, there's that 1,200 foot siding, again, anticipating uh, all of that traffic, all of that business that's gonna be happening. We're gonna have to be switching trains and 
uh, those types of things at Lee Blaine. This one was kind of interesting. This was the one that kind of got my head sort of scratching it, and it said Lee Blaine Pit. And so obviously there was a ball, there was a pit. They were digging something out of here, and, and I sort of thought in my head, well, it's got to be ballast, right? They're digging ballast when they were building the road. So 1,100-foot ballast pit. The only problem was, where the heck was this ballast pit, right? Like, the siding is uh, on the map, but this this spur is not on anywhere on a map, right? So I had to do a little bit of forensic investigation. Now, here's another piece of the mystery. So this uh, is from an article that was published in 1919. Don't know when it was written. Uh, I'm assuming maybe the year before, so I'm, I'm assuming, say, 1918. And basically, it's written about a canoe trip that's happening in the Boundary Waters area. And so the author is talking a little bit about canoeing on Gunflint Lake. Uh, and so it says, five miles of steady grind, and we stop for lunch at the Indian Mission site. The Hudson's Bay Company trading post a mile from the west end of the Canadian shore. So this is 1918, and we're talking about a trading post that's not at the Narrows, that's a mile from there, right? So I'm trying to think in my head, well, Lee Blaine's about a couple of miles from the Narrows, right? Is this what they're talking about? Uh, it was deserted. Um, it says, um, but the Indians still live there part of the year and bring their furs to trade in the winter, right? So there's this whole kind of mystery here because there's things that are coming and going and then things that don't necessarily make sense. So again, come back to a map. So this map was um, published in 1929, but the survey for it uh, was done in 1911. This is the uh, map was uh, put out by the International Boundary Commission. So when they actually did the official survey of the boundary between Canada and the United States. And so it essentially is a snapshot of what this area looked like in 1911. So uh, you can see the west end of Gunflint Lake here. You can see part of Magnetic Lake. You can see the railway line here. You can see basically this beach here at Lee Blaine. You can see one structure right here, which I'm assuming is a station. You can see this siding here, okay? And then you can see the railway line, uh, you know, continuing on. Then we get to Gunflint Narrows. You can see a collection of buildings here, which would sort of correspond to what, what I just told you about, how everything kind of shifted from Lee Blaine to the Gunflint Narrow. So we zoom in to that area around Lee Blaine, and again, uh, we see this one structure here, and not quite sure what this is here, right? This is, there's this little structure here um, that's kind of, um, you know, a little distance from it, kind of outside of the bay, um, just sort of at the, uh, the mouth of this little creek that comes out. Is this the trading post that they're talking about? Uh, I've never kind of gone there and, and, and checked anything out to see what potentially could be there. Um, again, I don't know. I know that there was a, a hotel. Uh, there was a structure here, and then I'm going to show you what, you know, why we know that. Uh, if we zoom in on the Gunflint Narrows, we can basically see um, that narrow waterway between um, Gunflint Lake and Magnetic Lake, and we can actually see five structures here on the Canadian side. So we basically have four here kind of lined up, and then there's one a little bit closer uh, to where the actual um, bridge was um, crossing the Narrows. Okay, um, so back to kind of talking a little bit about kind of how this all plays out with regard to Le Blaine. Le Blaine. So uh, eventually what ends up happening is uh, when the railway is constructed, um, more and more these uh, Toronto investors start to take ownership of the line. Uh, the guy that you see here on the screen uh, is William Rees Brock. He is elected president of the railway um, that year and he remains president of the railway right until uh, it is eventually absorbed uh, by another railway. Uh, and so uh, it's basically talking about how they're taking control and, and they are sort of shaping the fate of what is going to happen uh, with this railway and obviously what is going to happen with Lee Blaine. Now, the, uh, because of the failure of the mine, because the railway doesn't go anywhere, the, the railway is scrambling to make money. Uh, this is an ad from 1894 uh, and it's basically, they're, they're trying to, they're trying to jump on the tourist trade, right? They're, they're basically trying to capitalize on the fact that there are people that are trying to go westward. They're trying to go into um, the rainy lake countries, it says here in the ad. Uh, basically, they're going to get people special rates uh, for passengers. They're going to make boats available, canoes, things like that, uh, that people can go from Gunflint Lake uh, out to the rainy lake country, right? And again, because of all the economic opportunities that are out there. 
Um, so uh, what you're gonna see here is a series of time cards. Uh, this one's from 1894. Uh, notice the shift. So uh, the first time card that I showed you took seven hours for the train to make its way from um, uh, Port Arthur to Gunflint Narrows. Take a look at this one from 1894. Uh, it has now gone to almost 10 hours, right? So basically the train is leaving 10 o'clock from Port Arthur. It's arriving at Gunflint Narrows at 7.45 at night. Um, that is just a, a, a <laughs> unheard of amount of time, right, to, uh, to travel that distance. Um, just to give you some modern context, um, I can basically drive, um, I mean, there is a way to get there on the Canadian side. It's not very particularly easy, but even if I went um, via the American side, right, even if I drove from Thunder Bay to Grand Marais and then went up the Gunflint Trail uh, and then went to Gunflint Lake and went up the Gunflint Nar Narrows Road um, to that point, um, you know, basically in the general vicinity, it would take me about two and a half hours. Uh, and, and that is a much greater distance. It's probably about double the distance, right? So it, it, it's taken people a long time to get to this. So it's talking to you a little bit about what's going on with this railway line and, and, and how slow it is in terms of its operation. Uh, here's 1896 again, uh, taking that nine hours to get make its way down to Lee, uh, to Gunflint. Again, you can see Lee Blaine is, is on there, featured prominently uh, on, the, uh, on the time cards. Okay, um, this is 1897. What's also changing too is the amount of trains that are running. So when that first time card came out in 1893, there are um, three trains a week. So the train is leaving one day and it's coming back the next day. So it's running six days a week, right? Now all of a sudden, um, 1894, we're down to two trains a week, all right? So four times a week, okay? Two out, two in. Uh, and then um, same thing in 1896, 1897, we're down to one train a week, right? It's going Monday and it's coming back Tuesday, basically talking about the fact that they're not making any money. Um, and, and so they're just keep cutting back service more and more and more. Um, and so this reflects on the fact that the railway is having a lot of financial problems. By 1896, the railway has lost over $30,000. Uh, the Toronto syndicate, these Toronto investors have basically completely taken over the line. They've pushed out anybody, um, you know, any of the old original Port Arthur investors of the line. So they basically control the line completely and they are looking to sell it. Okay, they are sort of soliciting offers for it. Um, and their first offer comes in in 1898. Uh, so a guy by the name of William McKenzie and Donald Mann, uh, they purchased the line for $250,000. Now, unfortunately, the sale does not go through. It's actually overturned in court. And then the province of Ontario uh, orders the railway to be sold by tender um, because it is bankrupt. And so it is purchased by a guy named Emilius Jarvis for half a million dollars. And um, it doesn't explicitly say, but basically Jarvis was working for Mackenzie and Mann. So uh, again, the people who originally bought it end up buying it again and ends up costing a little bit more money. Okay. Uh, but Mackenzie and Mann eventually form a company known as the Canadian Northern Railway. And in 1901, the Port Arthur Duluth and Western Railway fades into history and the... Um, um, new name for the line is the Duluth Extension of the Canadian Northern Railways. Still reflecting the fact that Mackenzie and Mann still have aspirations of building this line through uh, to Duluth, um, just not right away. Uh, and so, just an ad here. This is an 1897 ad, basically talking about how that the you know they're looking to sell the, sell the railway. Um, and then here is the um, newspaper article. You can see the 5th of August, 1899. This is from the the um, uh, from the Globe in Toronto. Uh, basically, the railway being sold for half a million dollars. And so, this was a very transformative point because this is where uh, the story of Lee Blaine basically starts to come to an end. Um, and so uh, this is one of the earliest time cards that was put out uh, by Canadian Northern uh, under the new name, the uh, Duluth section, the Duluth extension. And so you can see the date here of May 1901. Um, again, the, um, the, the speed of the railway has picked up a little bit. Uh, it's only taking the, uh, the railway eight hours uh, to make its way down to Gunflit Lake. Um, but um, you're going to start to see some real sort of significant 
uh, changes happening. This is October of 1901, uh, and really that's the last time that we start to see trains full-time running down to, um, down to Gunflint. Uh, it becomes apparent to the new company that there's no traffic, there's no business down to Gunflint Lake. So in 1902, uh, they temporarily halt uh, trains running to Gunflint. Basically, the trains are going to North Lake and stopping and turning around. Um, the service is restored for part of 1903, but then the um, uh, termination of Gunflint from the line becomes permanent. Okay, and so here's a time card from 1902, so February of 1902, and it basically says here, the bottom's a little bit cut off here, but it says uh, trains going through to North Lake, right? So they're not going through to Gunflint. Uh, and then 1903, you can see here that um, basically uh, service has been restored to Lee Blaine uh, for a period of time. But then if we fast forward a few years, this is 1906, and basically you can see that Gunflint still appears on the timetable, but the train isn't running there. It's just running as far as North Lake, and they're turning around at North, North Lake, and they're heading back, right? So Gunflint has been completely cut off. And so uh, obviously this is talking about the fact that, um, you know, the, the, the tether has been cut, and, and this area is, is ceasing to become important anymore. Now, there is a little bit of a revival um, that happens. Uh, the name, one of the reasons why Lee Blaine doesn't immediately fade away is because of what you see up here on the screen. And so, in, starting in 1902, um, a company by the name of the Pigeon River Lumber Company, and again, if you've been tuning into these presentations, I did a presentation on this uh, back uh, about a month ago. And uh, basically what they did was they built a logging railroad uh, in the area down the east side of Gunflint Lake and beyond. And so um, obviously this um, uh, railroad was built to um, facilitate the logging that was going on. And because of that, both governments set up um, customs houses uh, on their respective sides of the border. And so what's interesting about all of this, and this is an article from the Fort William uh, Daily Times Journal of 1903, and it talks about the customs agent at the time, Thomas Roberts, uh, this morning is leaving for, nice typo here, for La Blaine or La Blanc, I'm not quite sure what they're trying to, to write there, on the Duluth Extension, uh, which he will be acting as the sub-collector of customs, right? And so the government decided that, of course, this customs port is going to need a name. And so what they're going to do is they're going to steal the name from the nearby town, because it is technically a town. Um, they are going to steal the name for it, and they're going to call this customs outport Lee Blaine. And so Lee Blaine uh, basically kind of continues to exist uh, for a number of years, uh, right up until 1909. Um, again, it's uh, this area is still being ignored. North Lake is the terminus for the uh, for the railway. Uh, the picture that you see here in front of you is the station that North Lake that was constructed in 1907. Um, and uh, again, I mentioned this earlier in the presentation. I'm actually going to be heading down um, to the North Lake station. Um, on Saturday, uh, weather permitting, and I'm um, going to be sort of poking around in the area. So if you do follow me on social media, look out for some, some pictures and some videos uh, of that. So uh, again, um, the, uh, the rail line west of North Lake was used up until 1909, and then the Pigeon River Lumber Company kind of concluded their operations. And uh, unfortunately, a, a forest fire broke out in the area in late May 1909, and that forest fire, we don't know exactly when because there's no local articles that talk about it. Um, we don't know exactly when, but some point, um, most likely or the first couple of days in June, um, at the west end of Gunf uh, North Lake, there's a, there was a 1,000 foot trestle. That trestle burned. Uh, and so here's a newspaper article. This um, is dated the 5th of June. Um, and so it basically talks about how there's um, fires near North Lake on the line of Duluth Extension. One railway bridge has been destroyed. There's only one railway bridge on North Lake, and that's, that's that big trestle. Uh, and so, again, we refer back to that 1911 map. And so, essentially, you can see here that this map is showing, in fact, that 
the, the link is gone. The bridge uh, over Trestle, uh, this bay, which it technically is known as Goose Bay, um, today, um, I don't know, but on the Minnesota side, but on Ontario side, I've always known it as Trestle Bay. Um, the, the trestle here is gone, right? They're basically showing you that it's it's been burnt. And when you travel there today, uh, this is basically what you can see. Uh, if it's a very calm day, you can see um, the, the piles have been burned off right to the level of the lake. Um, the rails are lying at the bottom. Uh, this is a photograph that was sent to me. This was taken in 2007. The, the level of the lake was very, very low, and it gives you a very, very kind of neat perspective of the um, the bay. You can see all the piles kind of lined up on the bottom. Okay, kind of really neat photograph. And again, like I said, if you go there kind of on a calm day, you, you see all of these things kind of lying on the bottom. It's actually kind of a little bit creepy, to be honest. Uh, and so because of this, this essentially severs the line. And so the next time card that comes out, you can see that Gunflint has been completely dropped from the uh, from the railway timetable, right? So um, there's no way of getting trains out there any longer. And essentially, this is the end of anything at Lee Blaine, anything at Gunflint, uh, because it's effectively gone. Uh, again, um, I didn't mention this, but really we don't have any photographs uh, of Blue Blaine. We don't know what it looks like um, other than that 1911 map. Um, we don't know what type of structures were there uh, beyond some of the, um, you know, some of the archaeology that I'll, I'll talk about very shortly here. Um, we only have a couple of photographs um, of actual rails here. We don't have a date on this particular picture. Um, it has been suggested this was taken somewhere in that sort of post-1909 period, maybe 1910. Um, you can you can tell that the railway's kind of been neglected here. You can see a lot of kind of grass and weeds and things growing up on the line. You can see right here that, um, you know, some of the ballasting underneath these ties is has, has disappeared, right? So this is uh, maybe after the railway has stopped running into this period. But again, we don't know. It's This is probably somewhere along um, the North Shore of Gunflint Lake, maybe just east of Lee Blaine. Uh, again, you can see some very steep cliffs here in the background, and that's very consistent with um, sort of the... Uh, you know, what things look like on, on the North Shore of Gunflint Lake. Uh, the only other photograph we have is this one here. Um, this one was provided to me by, uh, by Sue Kerfoot. This one was taken by Justine Kerfoot. Um, so her, uh, her mother-in-law was, uh, this was taken in uh, the 1930s and there were still sections of rail uh, on Gunflint Lake. And um, so basically uh, people in the area would have used these little speeders. Uh, there were gasoline powered ski speeders to move back and forth uh, on the rails that were still there. Uh, a couple significant people in the, in the picture. So uh, the gentleman on the front here, uh, that's Walter Plummer, uh, who was uh, one of the, uh, the people that lived in the area around Gunflint Narrows. Uh, and then I don't know which one, but one of the two ladies in the background is May Spunner, who was uh, Justine's uh, mother. Uh, who was the original owner of uh, the Gunflit Lodge um, when uh, when Justine first arrived out there? So again, these are the only two sort of photographs that we have in this area. Could, this could have very well been taken somewhere around Leap Lane. Uh, again, we 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 don't have uh, a description of the location. Uh, I did mention to you that you mean uh, our amount of information about what Lee Blaine looked like and um, you know what might have been there is fairly limited. This is one of the, the good sources that we have. Um, so this was an article uh, that again, it was published in the Minnesota History News, as you can see I've handwritten across the top there in June of 1962. And so um, it's kind of hard to see in the picture here, but actually you can see one of the rock ovens in the area and it's still intact. It still has, it hasn't collapsed yet uh, and they've all collapsed. Um, but basically, um, you know, it sort of gives you an idea. And in the article, she talks about, you know, what was at Lee Blaine, uh, and then what was at Gunflint Narrows. And so again, we have some, some idea of what was located there. So the last part of the presentation here, ladies and gentlemen, is, uh, just essentially me kind of showing you what the area looks like today. And again, um, archeology span is uh, a big part of the knowledge base that we have. Um, because there's such limited information from the period, uh, all we can do is try to deduce from some of the limited archaeological work that's been done. I'm not an archaeologist, um, 
and so I'm not trained to do this type of stuff. Um, I don't really want to get into, uh, because I'm not trained, I'm not technically, um, you know, sort of uh, allowed to do some of the archaeological work. Um, and, and so again, you know, what we know is fairly limited. So uh, what you see in front of you here is one of the rock ovens. Um, and we believe there were, uh, we, we know of um, at least four uh, of these rock ovens. There was potentially a fifth. Uh, rock oven at the site. So this is one of the ones, this is located kind of at the north end of that bay where Lee Blaine was. This fo particular photograph was taken in 1997. And again, I mentioned there's a couple big events that happened after that. In 1999, there was a big blowdown that knocked down millions of trees. And then in 2007, there was a forest fire. And so this is a picture of that same rock oven that was taken in about 2012 or 2013, somewhere in that time frame. And so you can see things have, uh, you know, the, the rock oven itself is, is still relatively the same, but obviously the background has changed a bit. Um, this was one that I, I initially didn't know. Um, both of these rock ovens are right, just right beside the railway grade. Um, this one here, I didn't even know, is it's, it's located just like a couple of feet, a few feet to the west of that one here. Um, and you, you can see sort of the collection of rocks. It's this one kind of is more pro, uh, pronounced. Actually, the top is just kind of collapsed right down on top of it. Um, and this one was here. This one's a little bit closer to where the station was. So on the north side of the railway grade, um, closer to, like I said, where the station was. You can see this one here had a tree growing on it. Again, this was back in 1997. And um, this is what it would look like. This was taken in 2012, this picture. Uh, unfortunately, what happened on in the area around Lee Blaine was after that massive blowdown. Um, so just the year after, the government of Ontario allowed loggers to come in and log and pick up all of those fallen trees. And so unfortunately, um, that this particular one, um, I was told, was uh, was unfortunately damaged in that uh, in that logging operation. Uh, this one was just a short distance from the the previous one that we just saw. Again, this one was in much better shape. This one was a 1997 picture, and this is what it looks like today. It's not bad. Some of the rocks have sort of collapsed, kind of inwards um, uh, into the uh, into the opening. Uh, this is the uh, the actual siding at Lee Blaine. So this is um, the station would have been located uh, just a little ways up here somewhere. I've tried looking for the remains of, of a station in here. I've never been able to find anything um, in that area. I haven't gone through with a, with a metal detector to see if we found any metal content or anything like that. But um, at the time, I, I couldn't find anything. Uh, you'll notice sort of this big kind of what looks like a pond on the side. And if you recall, um, when I was talking about Lee Blaine, I did say that there was a 1,200 foot siding and there was also a spur. Well, this is where that spur part comes in. Uh, this pond was actually man-made. This is actually the ballast pit. So this is kind of the eastern end of it. And so there would have been a rail line kind of running straight through the middle of this um, this pit. Uh, and then once you get a little bit farther in, it becomes filled with water. Um, and how do we know that? Well, in uh, 2012, um, I, I went to that site with a, a man by the name of Harold Allenon. Um, Harold is a local author and, and, and researcher and historian. Uh, he's also an amateur archaeologist, so he's allowed to, uh, to do some of this digging work. And so this is what we actually pulled out of um, that, uh, that pit, that pond. So basically in a straight line, we found um, uh, spikes and bolts and all types of things. These look like bucket handles up here, right? And so uh, we knew that that spur that I couldn't find before was running straight through the middle of that, uh, what is now a pond. And these were some of the other things that we found that day. Um, you know, you can find there's this little piece, looks like a piece of a, of a hand wheel, right? A horseshoe, again, those bucket handles, um, uh, bits of coal. And so this was sort of a, a map that I made up, sort of superimposed onto, onto Google Earth uh, of what the site kind of looks like. And so basically we have a series of rock ovens to the north. Uh, we have rock ovens down here. The station was somewhere here. You can see this pond here with the spur running through the middle. And then all throughout the area would have been sort of cabins. And this information was provided to me uh, by, by Bruce Kerfoot, again, who would have seen this area when some of these structures or the remains of some of these structures were still around. And then down here, right near the beach, would have been the location of um, uh, of this hotel, this trading post that was there. And so in 2013, uh, I visited the site 
uh, with Bruce and uh, uh, Harold Allenin was with me again. And so we had an opportunity to kind of look around and Bruce kind of showed me what he had seen and what he had remembered. And so um, again, just looking down the beach here at Lee Blaine. So just inside the tree line here, uh, he took us to a spot where you could actually see two kind of depressions in the ground, kind of side by side. And basically he said that he believed these were the, uh, were the cellars underneath where this hotel structure was. Uh, and then all around the perimeter, so Harold with his metal detector, he basically said there's there's basically there's nails all around, and you could you know you could see them, right? So essentially, what happened is as that structure rotted, all of the nails basically fell straight down, and so there was a pattern of nails, you know, uh, in kind of a rectangular shape around those two depressions in the ground. And so this would have been the view from the hotel. Again, uh, would have been a very, very beautiful spot looking out over, um, you know, Gunflint Lake and this beautiful beach that's that's located there. And so all around the site, there's all kinds of objects. The only problem that we have is is sort of dating them. Do these date back to the uh, period that LeBlaine was around or were these things dropped by people afterwards? Obviously, there was a lot of people, um, you know, that traveled on Gunflint Lake and, you know, uh, you know, the Gunflint Lodge has been on Gunflint Lake since 1928, right? It was people dropping things in the years afterwards. We did find a lot of beer cans. Um, so we know those are a little bit more modern. Um, you can see shards of, of, of ceramic here. Um, that were located in the area. Again, all kinds of, of buckets. This was probably the most intriguing item we found. Um, Harold pulled this out of the ground um, um, after finding it with his metal detector. Uh, if you don't recognize what it is, this is a skate blade. And so this would have been an old school style skate, which basically was just the metal blade. And then if you can imagine, uh, it would have had leather straps uh, and the leather straps would have basically allowed you to secure it to the bottom of your shoe. And that would have made a skate. And so you can almost sort of picture this in your head of, you know, people who would have been out there at the time, you know, skating on f the frozen Gunflint Lake at the time, right? Like you can just, tr you sort of gives you a little bit of a glimpse into life at Lee Blaine because again, we don't have any type of, um, whether it be, you know, a documentation about like what the structures were like there or, or, or personal accounts, right? And so this is one of the few things that we have that sheds a little bit of light on what it would have been, you know, what it would have been like to live there. Um, you know, again, um, you know, buckets, um, this, you can't really see this. I, I wish I would have gone in there a little bit earlier that, that year. Maybe I'll, I'll get there at some point when, when the, there's no leaves. Uh, but basically this was right behind where that hotel was located. And there was very, a kind of a rectangular shaped berm. And so Bruce believed that this was essentially a, a cold cellar, um, for this, uh, for this hotel, right? Um, you know, had these sort of high earthen sides, uh, and it would have been obviously used to, uh, to store items in. Uh, again, you can see all these types of objects, cups. Uh, this is a piece of iron bar. It was actually forged at one end, so it almost looked like it was a, a chisel of some sort. Um, and, and so again, um, this sort of brings us to the end of the uh, of the presentation. Uh, I wish there was more that we could talk about about you know what was um, you know what was at Lee Blaine. Um, I, I'd love to get you know some real archaeologists in there, and I've I've tried over the years. Uh, to, to do that. Unfortunately, um, it, you know, it's the same story on both sides of the border um, that, I mean, there's not a lot of money um, to do this type of work. And certainly at a, at a time like now when, when the world's going through a very difficult situation, this is the furthest thing from, from people's minds. Um, but, um, you know, uh, I'd love to have uh, an archaeologist come in there and, and, and sort of do some digging and, 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 and uh, you, know, you know, do proper excavation. And, and maybe we'll get a little bit more information about what uh, was there and, and, and what people would have experienced living um, at that, that particular site. Now, um, one thing I did want to mention before the end, uh, I know some of you, um, you know, maybe travel up to Gunflint Lake. Um, some, some, you know, there's obviously people that travel from the, uh, from the Minnesota side, there's people that travel from the Ontario side. Um, please, it's very important, folks, to, um, to make sure we're not kind of removing some of the items from here. Um, you know, I've noticed over the years that, you know, things have sort of gone on. Um, I, I didn't show you any photographs of them, but for example, that, that cross 
um, you know, west of Lee Blaine, where, where, where Joseph Montagia died uh, a number of years ago. Uh, somebody, um, they were trying to do a good thing. They, they basically painted, not over the cross, but around it. They painted his name and his date of death, and they spelled his name wrong on there, um, you know, uh, and then um, around that same time, I noticed people had gone in and some of the rock ovens, they'd actually moved some of the stones out to kind of clear out sort of the circular pattern of the inside of the rock oven. Uh, again, I mean, we're talking about things that, you know, date back to the, uh, to the 1890s. It's really important uh, that we're not sort of disturbing things, that we're just sort of leaving them as they are. So, you know, you've probably seen the saying before, I take only photographs, leave only footprints. Um, you know, who knows what has disappeared from that site over the years. Uh, there's probably things that we could have learned about. There's probably information that we could have gotten from there, had some of these objects sort of stuck around. But, um, you know, sometimes people have the propensity to, uh, um, to pick things up and do that. So, you know, sort of please leave those things as they are if you do visit the site. Um, so um, as we uh, sort of conclude for this evening, um, I do want to mention uh, the next presentation that is coming up. And again, a lot of these subjects are all intertwined. So we did talk a little bit about this um, this evening, but I will be getting into it in a lot more detail in a couple of weeks. So my next presentation will be coming up uh, on Tuesday, May the 19th. So two weeks from today, um, same time. And so the topic is going to be about the pulse in mind. So looking specifically at that topic. And um, this is actually interesting because uh, I've never done this particular presentation before. This is actually kind of a revamped presentation. Uh, and the reason why is I'm not just talking about the work that was done um, around the time that the railroad was built. I'm actually going to be taking a look at some of the subsequent efforts to get that mine opening uh, open right up until 1921. And I'm actually have a little sort of, once I finish the book that I'm working on right now, um, which has been kind of delayed because of the whole uh, COVID situation. Uh, once I finished that, my next goal was to write an article uh, about uh, this 1921 effort to get the mine open. It's kind of a very intriguing story, and um, uh, I'll be talking a little bit about that in a couple of weeks. So please make note of that. Uh, again, there will be um, information going up on social media, uh, so you can tune into that. Um, and so uh, this brings us to the, uh, the end, again, of the presentation. I did, uh, this is a screen that you saw at the beginning. Uh, again, it might be repetition for some of you who've tuned in before. And so I do have a very big presence on the, uh, on the internet and social media. And so I do have a website um, that you can visit. There is actually a section specifically on uh, Lee Blaine. And so from there, you can actually see some of these maps. Uh, you can see some of the pictures that I showed you in here. There's also uh, links to some videos. Um, I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, YouTube. I do have, uh, again, a YouTube channel. I do have a playlist of videos that I've made at Lee Blaine uh, over the years. And so there are probably, uh, I want to say there's about four videos or four videos. Uh, there's a 1997 one that you can see some of the stuff from 1997 as it was, and then there's some stuff from 2012, 2013. Uh, again, you'll see the rock ovens. Uh, you'll see where that hotel site was, and some of those things that we kind of pulled up out of the ground. Um, I have been doing a lot of, um, you know, certainly with the uh, with the situation that's going on and. Um, I have been spending some of my weekends going out and doing uh, a little bit of field work kind of in the local area. And so there's a lot of new videos up on, on, on YouTube uh, with a lot of uh, you know, new sites to check out. Like I said, hopefully, um, fingers crossed, I will be down at North Lake this weekend and I will have some videos and some pictures up of that. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you'll see my email address up on there. So please do not hesitate to uh, shoot me an email. And if you have any questions. Now, you'll notice at the very bottom, there is a link, this little bit.ly link. Now, I did check it last week, and it still should work. So what that is, is that is a link. So if you want to screenshot that or write that down, uh, if you go to that link, what it is going to do is it's going to bring up um, the online version of the Thunder Bay Museum annual publication called Pulp Papers and Records. And so in the 2015 edition, 
Uh, I have an article that was published in there about Lee Blaine. And so you can go in there and read uh, and get a lot more information than I've presented to you. So you're going to get a lot more background information uh, about people like Blaine and Lee and, um, you know, maybe some of the little small little details that I left out in tonight's presentation. So please make note of that link. Uh, again, this presentation will be saved on YouTube, so you can go back and take a look at it. You can share it with uh, people who haven't caught the presentation. So um, uh, please feel free to do that, and please feel free to check out the article. So again, I want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight, and uh, thank you for helping me uh, keep the history um, alive. Um, our shared history, because I know there's people uh, on both sides, of, both sides of the border that are tuning in. And so again, please join me in a couple of weeks for that presentation on the Pulse in Mind. Again, um, the story is intertwined um, with, uh, with um, both sides of the border. Uh, and so there's a lot of sort of intriguing things to talk about, so maybe some things that we haven't taken a look at in these earlier presentations. Uh, and again, so if you have any questions, you have anything that you want to know about, uh, please don't hesitate to contact me, and I uh, thank everybody for tuning in, and I hope everybody stays safe, and we'll see you back in a couple of weeks. Good night.